Football's kind of a boys sport, I guess. Uh, yeah, Linda's no longer here, so those of you who remember Linda Lovett, she was a football fan, and she would scream and holler, get up and nearly break the television set if her team wasn't winning. <laughs> so today, I want to talk about getting fit, getting spiritually fit. This is the probably the third and final kind of New Year-focused, um, you know, thing that I wanted to do with all of us, and, and like I I really use the new year in my life to evaluate where I am with the Lord, evaluate my, my you know, where I'm at with my family, and it's just a number of things with the church, and um, I, I think that's an important thing to do, whether you do it at the beginning of the year or in the middle of the year, to think about, you know, the direction and trajectory of our lives and what we can do to, I think, grow and to grow usually means making changes and, you know, assessing uh, the activities of our lives and determining which ones are important enough to make priorities and which ones are kind of getting in the way because we can't do everything. How many of you are getting old like me and you realize that more and more? Can't do everything. So you got to focus. You got to get laser focused on the things that matter. And so one of the things that I think we can do together is to talk about uh, what are the things we have to focus on to help us become spiritually mature, spiritually fit, uh, spiritually strong? And, um, and I, I feel like that's so critical, and especially, again, at the beginning of the year when we're looking at, at making commitments that will make this year different than perhaps the last year was. I, for one, am looking forward to a very different 2016 than 2015. Anybody else in the room? Okay, yeah, there's almost a sense a few of you didn't raise your hand, so God bless you. I'm glad you had a great 2015. Uh, some of us just, it wasn't a great year, so we want to we wanna see the Lord do some, some special stuff. And, and um, so we've been talking the last two weeks uh, about how to kind of align ourselves uh, with God's inclination to uh, bless us and to take us forward. Today, I want to talk about spiritual fitness, sort of making an analogy to physical fitness. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, and all the passages are on your uh, outline today because we're not doing what we typically do and will do again very soon, that is take a book of the Bible and work through it. So this is a topical message today about getting spiritually fit. Get fit. Uh, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit. It is of profit, <laughs> amen, but of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. What we do to, to strengthen ourselves spiritually is preparing us for the future, when we're with God, I, I look at it like if you were traveling uh, to live in, a, in another country, it would be wise to learn the language of that country so that you were fluent when you got there and could communicate and enjoy that culture. And in a real sense, this life for us is a preparation for the life to come. It's not that this life is unimportant. In fact, I think that makes it more important. But we are learning together the language of heaven, the language of God's new creation. And that is not just something that will happen automatically. That is something we have to decide that we want to actually learn. Just like if you wanted to learn Spanish or another foreign language, you would probably get the Rosetta Stone, you know, software, and you would have to apply yourself to learning it. And so I want to look at these um, basic, basic uh, disciplines today to strengthen our spiritual health. And I look at it a little bit like the, the various uh, major muscle groups that the human body has. If you're interested in fitness and you go to the gym, you know that, that, that you tend to work different parts 
of your body on different days, or maybe you do an upper body workout on one day and a lower body workout on another day, an aerobic exercise on another day, but you focus particularly on these various muscle groups, your quadriceps, your triceps, your biceps, your quadriceps, you know, whatever, I already said that. The other ones, if you're like me, you concentrate on your calves very, very much because you have pencil. My wife tells me she loves my legs. That's not good. When a girl loves your legs and wants them, that's not happiness. So, <laughs> so I don't wear shorts very often. But for, fi for physical fitness, you have aerobics, you have calisthenics, you have weight training, you have all these different things. But I want to look at our spiritual fitness today because uh, Paul said to Timothy, that is what counts most. So number one, if we're looking at these eight different uh, uh, areas as sort of muscle groups, we need to train each one of them so to become spiritually fit. Number one is to renew our strength through worship. To renew your strength through worship. This, is, this takes a, a commitment. Bala said several times today, we choose to believe you. We choose to obey you. We choose to worship you. These are, these are choices that need to be followed up with the means of transformation and changing us. It usually takes three big ideas for a person to change. It takes vision for the change. In other words, I've got to see a preferred picture of the future for my life if, I'll fo if, if I do this thing that I want to do. I have to have a vision pulling me into the future. Um, I also have to have the intention, which was what Bala was saying, choice. I have to make a choice here. I have to intend to change. It's not enough to see what things will be like when I change, but I have to have the intention to do so, to make the changes. And the third thing is I have to have the means or the resources uh, for that change. And, uh, and then I need to apply those. So we need those three things, vision, intention, and means in order to get us into God's future. And that's what these sort of become for us, these eight ideas um, become the means for that transformation, to renew your strength through worship. The Bible says, I love this, in Isaiah 40, 31, that God, let's read the rest out loud together, okay, really loud. God gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait upon the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Wow. Think about that. You know, as I was looking at these Hebrew words to really understand, because, you know, there's some ambiguity here. What does it mean to wait on God? What, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to mount up with wings as eagles? And, you know, the idea is that youths and people that exert a lot of energy and eventually get weary, that, that there will be something different that happens. There'll be strength instead of weariness, there'll be power instead of inability. And what's going to happen, God says, if you'll wait upon me, is you will sprout wings. That's what it means. You will sprout wings. In other words, something so transformational is going to happen in your life that it will be as though one who had no wings to fly will gain wings to fly. That, that's basically, he doesn't mean literally, of course, but he means you're going to see me work in your life in such a way that there will be power and energy in you that you could never, ever, ever have worked up on your own. But, the, but here's the deal. You have to wait on me. And wait is a worship word. Wait basically means to um, look to God with expectancy, to, to, another way the word is used is to lie in wait, to wait for, to linger for. It's not frenetic activity word. 
It's um, not trying to get it all figured out word. It's look to and for God. Go to him and seek him and worship him. Um, I love this passage of scripture in, in Psalm 95. I'm going to read it to you, 6 through 11. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Worship is about coming to a place that God has designated and humbly acknowledging who he is and being willing to submit to him. It's, it's this idea of bowing down, this idea of reverence, this idea that God is God and I am not. And I'm stopping all this frenetic activity. I already used that word. You're not supposed to do it twice. Um, and I'm going to just stop and wait and listen and be silent and, and maybe I, I'll even be loud, but I'll praise him. I'll, I'll, I'll express my humility and my love for God. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore my anger. Truly they shall not enter into my rest. Boy, this is such a important idea because really the opposite of of preaching is the phone ring <laughs> oops sorry guys people know I'm a pastor too it's like why would they call on Sunday morning my dad does that sometimes like dad how long have you known that I've been doing this but um, <clears throat> wasn't my dad but the, the, God's people were, were, were delivered from Egypt to go into the wilderness and to worship God, to, uh, to, to, um, to follow him and, and to honor him and to obey him because he promised that he was going to take them into the promised land. And they, they, they didn't trust God. They, they didn't want to wait on the Lord. They wanted things right now, the way they wanted it, how they wanted it, when they wanted it. And they started, the opposite of worship is whining. It's complaining. It's murmuring. And that's what Massah and Meribah are in this passage. They were not happy because God took them and they didn't have water. And so basically, they're, they're saying, God, you're not providing water right now for us. And God's obvious intention was to provide water for them, but they were upset because he didn't do it now. And how many of us find ourselves in that position where instead of worshiping God and saying, Lord, I'm thirsty, please provide water and I'll, I'll trust you and, I, and I'll serve you and I love you and you've delivered me and you deserve nothing but my worship, we start to accuse him of not being anywhere around. And that's what God's people did. They said, where is God? Moses, you said God's delivered us. Well, where is he? He's not giving me what I want. So he must not really be here. And how many of you know people do that all the time? When they don't get what they want from God, they start blaming God, they start accusing God, and they stop trusting God, and it leads their spirit and their soul to shrivel. And God says if we want to strengthen ourselves and expand ourselves in, in, in the Lord, that we, we must wait and we must worship him. And to worship like we were doing today, just, to give him our lives. But here's the deal. He doesn't care as much about our words as our hearts. We could sing all the songs in the world, but if our hearts aren't there, we could offer all the sacrifices, whatever it might be, but if, our, if we're doing our own thing, and Jesus himself said that. He said, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. They wanted their own, they created their own little um, ways and their own little rules to get what they wanted when they wanted it. And then they, then they said, this is what God wants. 
and you have to follow this. And all the people were, were, they were missing God because they weren't worshiping from the heart. And I love Psalm 51, 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So this isn't a self-willed thing. When we worship, we come together, whether it's publicly or privately, to bow our knee, to humble ourselves, to acknowledge that the Lord is God, to praise him, and to pray to him and ask him for whatever our needs might be, which leads to the second thing. So first, let's commit ourselves to worshiping God, to humbling ourselves and submitting to him, bowing our knees, bowing our hearts, bowing our heads. The Greek word for worship is proskuneo, which is to kiss the hand. It's this reverence. It's this, you are so superior to me. You are in such authority over all of the realm. Uh, you, you would often kiss the hand of a king. You're acknowledging this, this, that God is just so far above humans and me, and I am going to trust him. The, the, the second thing is to deepen our peace through prayer. The Greek word for prayer is interesting because it's like worship. Prasukomai. It's, I know nobody cares about this stuff. I learned Greek, so I'm going to make you listen to me. <laughs> so proskuneo is to bow and reverence and to kiss the hand in an act of adoration and worship and respect. Prasukomai is, is, is similar. It's, it's bowing in humility, but, but now you're actively engaging and you're asking. You're asking intensely. You're asking out of need. You're asking in acknowledgement of this amazing God who has all the resources of the world at his disposal, of the universe at his disposal. But we're, it's, not, it's not, see, here's what's so important. Look at what it says in Philippians, Paul says, and he's in prison, by the way, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is so powerful. He's saying, listen, you don't, don't worry. Turn your worries into prayer. S seek me. And now, notice he doesn't say command this or decree that or claim the other to have peace. He's saying ask. Prayer and supplication. Prayer, I'm coming to and I'm looking to you, God. Supplication, I have great need. Um, I, I have great want. I, I come in privation. I come to seek you and ask you and entreat you. That is the idea. If you I remember once I, I, this guy threatened to kill me, and I was scared because he could do it. And, and I thought he would, actually. And I, and I remember just being very fearful. And I finally, I said, Lord, I can't live like this. And I opened up the Psalms, and I started reading the Psalms, and I saw God's promises. What is man? You, know, you don't have to worry. Just trust me. And, I, and then I finally just got to the place of just asking for God's protection for his deliverance and began to worship the Lord, and that fear was broken. I didn't fear anymore. I, I just said, God, you're way bigger than this guy. You know, you can handle this. But that's the idea. Started thanking God. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. It's giving thanks in our prayers. God's there. He hears you. And I think we have to be very, very careful with these I decree, I declare. I, I just think demanding things from God is not healthy. It's just actually kind of dumb. You know, I, I don't know where people have got this. 
I, I do at the same time believe there are times where God will say something to you and he'll tell you, okay, now you need to, now you need to do what I told you to do, but Lord, there's a mountain in the way. So speak to the mountain. Fair enough. Okay, then obey God and speak to the mountain. But when it, in general, we don't decree things. What's that? Only God decrees. Or maybe the President of the United States, but you know, that's another thing. So, um, so, so again, don't, I'm not trying to be mean, spirited, but there's just this whole unhealthy brand of Christianity that makes people to be little gods. And let, let's just totally say together that is just not true in, in, the, in the sense of, of we be having the authority to just say and create things just because we're, we're saying them. That's, that's not what God is asking us to do. He's asking us to pray and to seek him and to thank him, and then we will have peace. See, God wants, he's more interested in us having peace than getting a new car. But if you need a new car, pray and ask him for it. Because if you, he says we have not because we ask not. So it's not that we can't ask, but ask. Don't, don't start demanding. I claim my new Cadillac in the name of Jesus. Well, okay, that's just dumb, you know. So you know how I feel about that. Um, I just think it's hurt a lot of people. It's made people, it's led them down these roads where they don't get what they want and then they, you know, they, they get, they think they're bad, they did something wrong, they don't have enough faith and, um, or they just get fed up and then they walk away from Jesus. And that happens all the time. So how many of you know life throws us curveballs, knuckleballs, spitballs, screwballs, it gets all sorts of balls that are hard to hit. And sometimes he thro the, the, the life throws balls right at us. And over 20 times in the New Testament, the Bible says, pray and ask. Pray and ask. It says, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. I, uh, I think it's so important. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, God never shuts his storehouse until you shut your mouth. <laughs> I like that. So pray so we can find peace, replacing the worry and the panic. Third thing is to strengthen your commitment through fellowship. Look at this passage of scripture, Hebrews 10, 24. Let's read this one really loud together, okay? Ready, go. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Beautiful. So basically, God is helping us understand that we can't be spiritually healthy, mature, fit believers without Christian friends, without people to run with, without people to trust, without people to ask to pray for us, without others to help bear our burdens and us bearing their burdens, without the community of relationship together. He's, God says we all need support. We all need to, um, to encourage each other because living this life is not always easy. There's no such thing, someone said, as a Lone Ranger Christian, and I believe that that's true. There are many people that say, I don't need God. I don't need church, rather. I'm sorry, I got God. I go out into the beach and I go to the mountains and I go to the parks and and I pray and me and God we're tight but the people there in those churches boy they're a little bit nuts I don't want to go and get involved or I went there and and there's a lot of good reason people get hurt in churches and and I totally can um you know empathize I guess or sympathize with with that 
But, but you can't isolate yourself. You have to be involved in the lives of other believers. That's what God is telling us. Um, I let one of my favorite passages of Scripture is James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for another, one another. Why? So that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So what God, I hear God saying is, is if you will get into relationship with some people uh, th that you can trust and, and you can ask them to pray for you and you can say, listen, I'm struggling with this or that. It's like God's saying, you will be amazed how much prayer in this environment can accomplish in your life. But we're afraid. We don't want to open up that way. Um, I think that's one of the powerful things about uh, AA and NA and the recovery movement in our country is it provides a place where people who are really struggling feel safe to say, this is my sin and I need help. But how much better would it be if, we, if it was safe to do that in, in, in our community, you know, in, in God's community, among his people, to say, I'm struggling with this. Will you pray for me? You know, I gather with a group of pastors on Thursdays. Every, every Thursday have been doing this for a few years now. And um, we, we open up to each other. We'll confess our sins to each other. We'll ask for prayer. And you know, um, this thing's been, it's, it's, it's actually growing, and it's sustained over these three years, and pastors come only because when they're there, they feel God's presence, and they get healed, and God hears those prayers. And the same is true for us. And uh, I think that one of the things I'm hoping to see us do this year is to reorganize ourselves a little uh, around our mini church structure and, and allow these little groups to become uh, places where we can grow together, where, where people can really engage each other and pray for each other and support each other and to see God do amazing things through our prayers together. Number, number four is expand your perspective through personal Bible study. Now, we've been talking about that. How many of you have started with the Hope Journal? Anybody in here? I see about oh, 10 or so people. Okay, fantastic. I was talking to Lisa the other day, and she told me what a blessing the Hope Journal has been to her through the, um, the soap process that's in the front of the journal. So she's been taking notes, spending time with the Lord every morning and writing down uh, the things that God has been showing her and then um, writing a heading for what that is and, and just, just telling me how much of a blessing it's been to her. And I was trying to talk her into coming up and sharing one of those today. But we decided not to. But I told her I was going to tell you what she told me, and that is she's been reading through the Bible since she was 12 years old every year. She's been writing and journaling, and she's, she told me, Jeff, this process with the Hope Journal and going through the SOAP and really doing it every morning has, has blessed me so much. And so I want to just encourage you to get a Hope Journal today if you don't have one and start the process of personal Bible study. See, we have to stop looking at things from just this narrow point of view, but we need a larger picture. We need to see the whole global view of God. The, the, the Bible tells us that, that studying his word helps me see from his perspective. And in fact, Jesus himself said, if you continue in my word in John 8, 31 through 32, then you're really my disciples. And I take this to mean that if you don't continue in his word, that you're not his disciples. I mean, what else could it mean? And he says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Notice the payoff on all this stuff. It's like God says, you do this, and, and I'm going to reward you. It's not just him making demands of us. 
He's actually trying to show us what, how to tap in to the abundant life that all of us long for. It's how to be healthy spiritually, but it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take carving out the time to do these things, to expand our perspective through personal Bible study, to know the truth, and to become free in our lives because of what God is doing in our lives and the way we're responding to life because we're seeing things from his perspective more and more. And that is exactly what these hope journals are designed to do, to help us engage, nothing else, just to help us to grow and become spiritually fit. Number five is increase your joy through witnessing. This one hit me really hard. I used to be a blabbermouth for Jesus. I used to be a, I used to be a gossip of the gospel. You know, I would I would just I would tell everybody I knew about Jesus. I mean, I just poor. I feel sorry for some of the people I told about Jesus because they didn't want to hear it. How many of you, when you first became a Christian, were just crazy, rabid, on fire for the Lord, and you told anything and anybody who went, I used to feel, I used to pick up hitchhikers only because then they would be a captive audience. You know, hey, I'm giving you a ride. You got to listen to me. <laughs> and I usually would just simply open it up with, hey, has anybody ever told you about Jesus? And they would usually say yes. And I would say something like, well, what did they tell you? And then they would say this, and then I would say, can I tell you uh, about what Jesus has done for me? Well, sure, and then just share my testimony. Real simple stuff. A bunch of people came to the Lord as a result of that. But now that I've got a little older and a little colder, oh, my. <clears throat> That's not happening so much. And I really felt like the Lord saying, Jeff, you need to increase your joy through witnessing. See, the great thing about being a witness is you're not the prosecutor. You're not the defense. You don't have to open and close the case. All you have to do is tell someone else what, in this case, Jesus has done in your life. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to be the most mature Christian in the world. You don't have to have a scientific explanation for the creation of the universe. You just have to tell people what Jesus did for you. And the result is, I promise you this, is amazing joy. There is nothing more wonderful than helping another person come to know Jesus Christ. It is you know there's only one fun place to be in a hospital, and that's where the babies are being born. Amen? Everywhere else in the hospital is not fun. But on the third floor at West, West Hills Hospital, that's where people getting into the elevator are smiling. And it's because new life is coming into this world. And, and the same is true for us. When God uses us as a spiritual midwife and we're just simply willing to share and, and, and give a, a testimony for what God has done. And, and that's what Peter was saying. He was saying, you guys, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. That doesn't mean, like a lot of apologists say, that you have to know everything. Just tell them what God did for you. He says, give the reason for the hope you have. That could be some biblical texts, but it's, it's really anchored in what has Jesus done? Let them hear it. Let them hear it. But do it with gentleness and respect. How many of you know that's a little bit important? Gentleness and respect is critical. Nobody wants to get beat over the head. We, Lisa and I went, uh, we saw, we took Luke to see Monster Jam uh, last night. How many of you know what monster trucks are? Oh, it's so cool. But it's like football. <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to go. But, or, but these giant trucks called Grave Digger and, you know, all these, they're jumping over these massive, it's so cool. There was L, um, what was the bull? El Toro Loco. Oh my gosh, this truck. Just amazing. Jumping high, did a flip in the air and landed. It's so, so amazing, so loud, so uh, incredible. And I know I was going somewhere with this. 
but I actually just now completely forgot. Does anybody know where I was going with this? Oh, yeah, so outside Angel Stadium, there, there's all these people holding up signs like turn or burn, you know, uh, stuff. Just, you know, that doesn't go anywhere. That doesn't help. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm actually being very opinionated today. Um, I don't think that helps. I don't really, I don't think. Um, God can use anything, amen? So, but I think what God wants us to concentrate is on, on our story with him. So maybe you could do this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a list of uh, four or five of my neighbors and my friends, and I'm going to start praying for them every day and asking God if he would give me some opportunities this year to share my story with them. And um, I'm just going to be more intentional about it, and I'm going to wait for a natural opportunity. I'm not going to you know, step in and make something happen and be obnoxious and try to be forceful. Just, just want to see God's, uh, God do great things. And he strengthens our joy in part because we're giving out. We're, 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 we're doing something. So many Christians nowadays think it's all about just us getting, you know, better and stronger and, and not thinking we've lost sight of the world and the world's need uh, and our call to make disciples of all nations, to bring people to, to Jesus. And um, we, we have to remember that a part of our spiritual growth comes as we share Jesus with others. Um, then number six is practice your love through giving. This one is important. In 2 Corinthians 8, they're all important. It says, see that you excel in the grace of giving to prove the sincerity of your love. When I read that, I was like, wow, that is powerful. Excel in the grace of giving to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, most television preachers will say, sow your seed into my wallet so your harvest will grow. It's interesting that the soil is their wallet, right? But, uh, but, but here, and th there is a harvest principle. I, I hate to even say it today because it's so abused. But as we give, God gives back to us, okay? And he's the one that uses the idea of a harvest, so we have to, you know, just honor the Bible. But it's got so twisted from the television the televangelists and the preachers that, it, it, that it's difficult. But here it says, see that you excel in the grace of giving to prove the sincerity of your love. So you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Um, when I first fell in love with Lisa, I was continually broke. I didn't tell people that. I couldn't keep money in my pocket. I just wanted to buy her everything I could because I loved her so much. And God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten son. The Bible says that our giving is a test of how much we love the Lord. It's a test of how much we love Christ. So we practice our love through giving. Now, there's a lot of ways to give. When there's a need and you have the ability, give, be generous. If you possibly can. But then there's a systematic part of this giving, not just spontaneously as a need presents itself. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul says, on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money you have earned and give it as an offering. And that says three things about the exercise of giving. That one, it should be systematic on the first day of the week. And that was Sunday. Every Sunday, like, like clockwork, he's saying, be systematic about it. Secondly, each of you should set aside. That means you plan it. You don't just wait till Sunday rolls around. You kind of think about it. You might budget it. You might plan it. Thirdly, he says, a sum of money that you have earned and give it as an offering. It ought to be in proportion to what you've earned. 
if you make a lot of money, you probably give a lot of money. Some of you in this church are incredibly generous because you make a, 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 good, a good deal of money. Others don't necessarily, but they still give according to what they have earned. Some people, most people use the tithe as a principle to govern their giving. That's what we do. We do that plus, but, but it's 10% as a basic expression of love and trust in God that he'll take care of us and that this is just an expression that this all belongs to him anyway, but it's a good, a good place to start because it was a biblical framework that was used before um, the law of God and and Jesus, you know, acknowledged its importance. And so it's, it's probably a good place. Plus, it's just, you know, if you make a dollar, it's a dime. If you know what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's something that we can all do. And it shows that we love the Lord. And it shows that we love each other. And because we, we use those uh, monies to provide for many different things that have to do with the church and uh, the needs of of the people in the body of Christ. Number seven, oh my gosh, Lisa told me I would never make it um, through this sermon in a half hour. She was right. I'm almost done though. Seven is develop your talents through service. So here's on number six though. If you've never tithed in your life, I know what that feels like. I remember thinking to myself, I am going to die if I tithe. And by the way, why didn't they tell me about this before they told me about Jesus? Because I, I'm not sure I would have got in the door that way. Um, and one person said, Jeff, it's like, it's like jumping in a, a, you know, kind of a cold pool on a hot summer day. You're really freaked out about it, and you tend to walk around and dip your toe in the pool and then your leg and it takes you a long time to get in and sometimes you never go in the best way is just to dive in the deep end and it's never as bad as you think it is and in fact it's really refreshing and just watch what God will do as you take these steps to obey him and honor him and and so I, I did that and I and I found God you know totally blessing my life as a result, not with a bunch of money. See, that's what everybody wants to tell you is, is you give God $10 and he'll give you back a hundred. No, 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 no. He might give you back a thousand. He might give you back a million or he might give you back two. That's up to God. Um, I know good people that have tithed for a long time, and they're not millionaires. You know, they've gone through struggles financially. Does that mean that God isn't, you know, doing his part? No, 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 no. God doesn't say, give to me um, so you can get something. He's saying, give to me, give me your heart, and I will bless you, and I'll increase you. And I'll, you know, so there's lots of ways that God can bless us and increase us and prosper us. It's not always tied to the, the dollar amount. Amen? I know some of you are looking at me like, Jeff, you're not saying. It is true that often that blessing will come in the form of monetary provision. But I just think it's wrong to mislead people and tell them if you sow a seed of $1,000, you're going to get $10,000 back. That's just, I'll, again, it's my opinion. I'll just move right along. And um, <clears throat> Actually, what time is it? <laughs> yeah, so that was six. I think... I think I'll just, the, 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 the seventh is just develop your talents through service. Find a way to serve the Lord. You can do it here at this church. You can do it outside in the community. You can do it anywhere. But serve the Lord somehow. Serve him. Look for, look for a need and, and put yourself there and love the people, pray for the people, help the people. You know, there's all sorts of ways. As I said, in the church, there's a bazillion ways. 
from greeting and ushering to sound to worship to children's ministry to hospitality to things that we do to support each other as we gather um, opening up your home as a host home for a mini church I mean all these ways are ways to serve um, but there's think places outside the church also even in your workplace just serve the Lord there you know make the coffee do something just serve the Lord and he'll strengthen you he'll sharpen you he'll deepen you when you serve him unless you're doing too much then someone said you're not as bright as you th think you are when you're burning the candles at both ends and i agree with them that's but balance it out find a place to serve and number eight stretch your faith by risking risking is a part of the christian life and it's absolutely essential and God said in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible to please God without faith. Now, there are some things that I did this week, I'm sure, that did not please God because they weren't expressions of faith. And, and God says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And faith is like a muscle. It's got to be stretched, and it's the bottom line of the Christian life. If we want to be healthy and spiritually fit, we must take risks. Someone said faith is spelled R-I-S-K. So if we want to just live adventure-free, comfortable Christian lives, we're probably not going to be pleasing to God. Someone said, don't be afraid to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. If you want to sit under the tree and not take risks and not challenge yourself, that's what in Hebrews 11, they took the life of Abraham is mentioned more than anyone else is there. He's the, regarded as the father of the faithful in Scripture. He's, he, he, God said, he's, he's my friend. And everybody who lives like Abraham is a friend of God. And, and Abraham was not a perfect person. He made a lot of mistakes. He was as human as you and me. Under pressure, Abraham told lies. Twice he gave away his wife to save his own life. But James 2.23 tells us that Abraham was called a friend of God. Despite all of his failures and all of his faults, God said, this man is a friend of mine. Why? Because of his faith. We don't have to be perfect to be spiritually strong and to be close to God. But we do have to take risks. Someone said there's three kinds of people in this, in the church. It may be a little simplistic, but he said there are undertakers. Undertakers are afraid of serving. They're afraid to get involved. They don't really care about others. Their desires, their will is more important than the good of others. God exists in their mind to serve them. They don't exist to serve God. And undertakers give only when it gets them something. They serve only when they're noticed. They come only when they can control things. Second are caretakers. Caretakers only serve their own. They care um, not about reaching the world for Jesus, but they just want the church to be a comfortable place for them. They don't want anything to upset the status quo. A caretaker would rather see their friends and family uh, maybe not even make it into the kingdom rather than lift a finger to minister to them. And the truth is, sadly, that most churches today are caretaker churches. And I won't even go into the stats because I've done that so many times with you guys. But then there's risk takers. And without risk... There can be no closeness to God. 
You cannot minister to an individual or community unless you're willing to take risks. And those of you who've been around long enough know that we've taken our share of risks, but 2016, we need to do it again. We need to challenge each other. We need to be willing to go out of our comfort zones. I want to close with this little story. When Chuck Swindoll, he was a great preacher, was a small boy, he attended church every Sunday at a big Gothic Presbyterian cathedral. He said the preaching was powerful, the music was great, but for Swindoll, the most awesome moment in the morning service, if you could believe it, was the offering. Twelve solemn frock-coated ushers marched in lockstep down the main aisle to receive the brass plates for collecting the offering. I mean, how can you make the offering sound any cooler than that? These men, so serious about their business of serving the Lord in this magnificent house of worship, were the business and professional leaders of Chicago. One of the 12 ushers was a man named Frank Loesch. He was not a very imposing looking man, but in Chicago, he was a living legend, for he was the man who stood up to Al Capone. In the prohibition years, Capone's rule was absolute. The local and state police and even the FBI were afraid to oppose him. But single-handedly, Frank Loesch, as a Christian layman and without government support, organized the Chicago Commission. This group of citizens was determined to take Capone to court and put him away. During the months that the Crime Commission met, Frank Loesch's life was in constant danger. There were threats on the lives of his family and friends, but he never wavered. Ultimately, he won the case against Capone and was the instrument for removing this blight from the city of Chicago. Frank Loesch had risked his life to live out his faith. And each Sunday at the point of the service when they marched down the aisle, Swindoll's father, a Chicago businessman himself, never failed to poke him and silently point to Frank Loesch with pride. And I thought, man, that is risky faith. That is courageous faith. That's the kind of faith I would like for us at least to think about, to consider. John Gardner said, one of the reasons why people stop growing and learning is that they become less and less willing to risk failure. We don't take risks because it's counterintuitive. Our fear and our instinct for self-preservation tell us to play it safe. But that's not what God says. One last quote is Sir Francis Drake said, Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your majesty. Where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Well, I know that there are things that God will call us to this year that will require that we take risks. The question is, will we say yes? Will we obey him? Or will we play it safe? If we want to grow and we want to mature and we want to be strong spiritually, then we must learn to become risk takers. For some of you today, it would be a risk to step over the line and finally say yes to Jesus. For some of you, a risk may be stepping into a ministry of some kind. For some, it may be beginning to give, to tithe, whatever it is. There's things that challenge us. In fact, every one of these areas may be something you want to consider as an opportunity for you to think about and ask God how you can move the ball forward this year so you could strengthen yourself in the Lord. Let's pray together.
Lord, we thank you for your your uh, word always. And thank you for the time that you give us to gather like this and to look together at the principles that you've placed before us to help us become more like Jesus. At the heart of growing and becoming more spiritually mature is that we become more and more like Jesus. We pray that this year you would help us. That these eight areas of, of thought and discipline would root themselves more deeply in our lives. We pray that you would help us to, to schedule them, to implement them. We pray that as we grow, as we change, as we become more like Jesus, that we would fulfill your very purpose for all of our lives and for our church as well together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.